Hey, and welcome back to AP Statistics. This is day 17, and we'll be launching into a new chapter on hypothesis testing. My name is Daniel Caproni, and if this is your first time joining us and you feel like you're lost or confused as to what's going on, you can always check out my YouTube channel at Mr. Caproni on YouTube. No space, no period, go ahead and search there, and you can see all 16 videos that came before this. With that said, we're going to be starting today on a new chapter, chapter 19 out of our textbooks that has to do with hypothesis testing for one variable proportions. We're actually going to start this chapter talking about some metal ingots. What the heck is a metal ingot? Well, I got some pictures here for you, if you did not know what that is. So take a look. It's basically a giant piece of metal. All right. Now, why would we need a huge piece of metal like this? Sometimes these are 20,000 to 30,000 pounds big. Why would you want just a giant piece of metal like that? Well, they use them for things like cars or airplanes or any type of large metal structure that needs to be very sturdy. The more pieces of metal that you have to weld together, the less stable that vehicle is going to be. So a lot of times when they're making a car or an airplane, they'll start off with one giant piece of metal and then shave it down into the part they need so that they're not putting together multiple pieces of metal, which will make their vehicle more likely to break down later. So. When they're creating this, because they're such huge chunks of metal, it's quite a process to get it all done. They have to actually find a whole bunch of metal that they want to use, then melt it all down. Then once it's in liquid form, they have to pour that entire thing into a giant mold. Now, once it's in the giant mold, they can work with it quite a bit from there to either shave it down to the piece they want or just kind of shape it into the general shape of the piece that they're creating. But once they get it into that general shape, they actually have to let it cool. And here's where the whole issue comes up because as it's cooling, some of the times this metal will crack and any type of crack or flaw ruins the entire piece and they'll have to start over from scratch which can waste a lot of time and a lot of energy for a company and that's actually where we're going to be diving in today and using this as an example for the hypothesis testing process we're going to go through so there was a company who's going through all of this and they're trying to reduce the amount of cracks they get from all of the cooling process now, initially, they know that over a few years that they've been doing this, about 20% of all of their ingots go ahead and get cracked, which means those are all useless and have to be redone, wasting them a ton of money. So they had a, an employee that came up with a new method, and they go ahead and try this new method out. All right, They do 400 different ingots with this new method, and out of those 400, 17% do crack. So that means that they went from 20% to 17. But the question comes in of was this just lucky? Was 17 close enough to 20 that really there was no difference and this was just a lucky batch that they did of 400? Or is 17 a far enough difference for us to be able to reject the original process that was given us 20% crack and tell us to start using this new process all the time because it wasn't just luck, it actually is better than the method we were using before. We actually have some tools in our belt from this class that we could actually answer this question pretty efficiently but it's not going to be the best method, which we'll get to later. But we do know that because we have a sample size of 400 and original information on this proportion, that we can actually use our ideas of sampling distribution and central limit theorem to give us the exact percent of time we would expect this to happen. Then using our own critical thinking skills, we can kind of say, all right, is that rare enough that we should go ahead with the new process or was it just luck? And this is just kind of a review of that process. So if we were using the central limit theorem and some of our sampling distribution stuff, we know the first thing we would need is to compute our standard deviation. So the standard deviation of a sampling distribution is just the formula square root of our probability of success times our probability of failure divided by our sample size. Um, now, when we are filling in, we want to use our original probability of success, which is that 20%. Even though cracking of the metal seems like it would be a failure in this case, that's actually what we're testing. So that's what we're going to label as our success. All right. So we'll use the 0.20 uh, for our standard deviation formula. 
And we're going to multiply that by 0.8, since that is our probability of failure, which we got by just doing 1 minus 0.2. And we'll divide that by 400, which is our sample size in this case. When you plug all of that into the calculator, you get something about 0.02, all right? So now that we have 0.02 as the standard deviation of the sampling distribution, we can look at z-scores to see exactly how many standard deviations away this sample was. And the way we would do that is just following our z-score formula, which says we take the sample proportion uh, minus the original proportion that we would expect, and we divide that by our standard deviation of the sampling distribution. So for us, that would be 0.17 minus 0.20 divided by our 0.02. Once you do that, you find out that we actually end up being about one and a half standard deviations below the expected value of that 20%. So the question is, is 1.5 standard deviations below our expected number rare enough? Well, we can use the normal CDF program in our calculator to go ahead and tell us that that should happen about 6.7% of the time. Again, if you want to check out how to do this the long way, we've covered it in past videos. You can go onto my YouTube with Mr. Caproni and check out those videos to see this process. But essentially, we just plug it into the calculator, all of the stuff we just found and the information we were given in the question. And it tells us that this will happen like a sample of 17% with 400 ingots would happen 6.7% of the time. Now it comes down to the critical thinking skill. If you went out and got a sample, and that sample should ever, ever only happen 6.7% of the time, is that rare enough for you to say, okay, the original process was probably wrong, and we should go ahead and start using this new process? Or is 6.7% of the time frequent enough that you're like, eh, it could have just been lucky this time, and maybe we just fell in that 6.7% of the time? Although this seems like it should be a very easy question to answer, a lot of time companies don't like this idea of just wishy-washy, I think I know the answer, I think I don't know the answer, and whatnot. So there is a formal process that you can follow, and that formal process of making this decision is called a hypothesis test. So today we're actually going to dive into what is a hypothesis test and what's the process for doing one. So let's go ahead and look at the full process first. And then we'll go ahead and talk about some individual pieces of that process today. Now, we won't be able to cover all of these parts of the process today, but we'll do that over the next few videos. And that way, once you put it all together, you'll have a general understanding of the entire hypothesis testing process. So let's break this down. Step one, check your conditions. Just like we've done in the past with our confidence intervals or other types of tests or things that we've been able to do, we always have a list of assumptions and conditions that we need to check first. This will be no different, and eventually we'll go through what are all of those conditions. They actually align pretty similarly to the same conditions we use for confidence intervals. Step two is to write a null and alternative hypothesis. This is the part today that we're going to look at what the heck is a null and alternative hypothesis. How do we write them? What do they look like? What do they mean? That's all going to be new vocab, so this will be the first time we see something like that. Number three is that you have to write out all the other given information. Now, the reason we do this is, number one, for the AP test, they're going to want to know everything you used in order to get your answer. But also, it helps us just kind of organize our thoughts before we plug things into the calculator and use it. Which test to use. For right now, this is going to be very easy because we only have one test we're going to be doing, and it's going to be called the Z score one proportion test. And we'll get more into that later. But as we continue throughout the rest of the videos for this year, you're going to see that we'll probably pick up five to six more tests. So this step is just kind of a general for all of those tests. How are we going to go about doing this? Well, we're going to have to pick which one to use first. Step five is plugging your information in the calculator. So you have all the stuff you want, you have all the information you need, now we just plug it in the calculator, which is why this becomes an easier process to do, and it's going to shoot out something called our p-value, and we're going to dig into what that p-value is later, probably in another video, and we're also going to describe what the level of significance is and how the two of those come together, all right? So once we plug into the calculator, it will shoot out the p-value, and step six is going to be comparing that p-value 
another new vocab word called the level of significance, all right? Don't get overwhelmed by all of these new vocab things. At first, it's going to seem a little overwhelming because it's all new and fresh. But we're going to be doing this process over and over and over, like I just said, like five or six different times. And it's always going to be the same seven steps. So by the time we're done doing all of these different tests, you're going to be a pro at knocking out all seven of these very easily. Our last step for this one is writing a conclusion. Once we get our p-value and our level of significance, writing the conclusion is where we're actually going to make a decision. Hey, we are going to reject the idea that this 20% process was the same as the 17% process and accept the idea that the 17 one was actually better and we're going to start using it. Or maybe we're going to say that we fail to reject that idea. So we should just keep using the 20% one and not switch. That's what the writing conclusion is going to come back to. It's going to be using all the information we found in this process and then also kind of plugging in bits and pieces from our question to place it in context of what's actually going on. So like I said, the first thing we're going to be diving into is our null and alternative hypothesis. What are they and how do we use them? So first off, let's look at the null hypothesis. Hypothesis are working models that we adopt temporarily. So it's kind of like we assume this to be true and we're going to base all of our decisions off the idea that this hypothesis is true. Now, just like in a science classroom, a hypothesis still stands in the same context of being this theory that we believe to be true and we're going to test to see if it is true. So it's kind of just something we believe at first and now we're testing to see if it's actually true. Our starting hypothesis is called the null hypothesis. Now this idea of null, if you didn't know, null just usually means the empty set or zero or things like that, which is going to make more sense why we denote this with an H and then a sub zero down below. So this symbol right here is very important and you're going to start learning as we go. But whenever we talk about a null hypothesis, we're going to write that as putting an H with a little sub zero down here, all right, which stands for the word null, the empty set. Now, that's just notation, that's how we use it, but our null hypothesis specifies a population model parameter of interest and proposes a value for that parameter. In our case, what was that? Well, the parameter, don't get overwhelmed by what that means. Remember, it just means whatever data we're collecting about the population. In this case, with our little metal issue we were dealing with earlier, our perimeter of interest is the proportion of cracked models. So in this case, it's going to be a P for proportion, okay? So we just use the P for proportion. We're not actually putting any numbers in on this side. The left-hand side of your null hypothesis will always just be whatever the parameter we're looking for. So maybe it'll be the proportion, maybe it'll be the mean, maybe it'll be the standard deviation. Uh, it could be any of those things. That's gonna be, that symbol will be the left side of your null hypothesis, okay? Then we say that our null hypothesis is that that parameter, in this case, the portion of success is equal to whatever the hypothesized value is. In this case, we said we believe that the original process gave us a 20% chance of success. So in this case, if we were going to write out a null hypothesis for this, we would say that our null hypothesis, HO, is P equals 0.20. Now, a lot of times people shorthand this, and instead of saying the null hypothesis, they just refer to this as your HO. All right. And likewise, as we move on, they're just going to refer to the alternative hypothesis represented with an H sub A as your ha. So if you ever hear me talking in class or if you walk by my room and you hear me talking about those hoes and those ha's, we're talking about hypothesis testing. I don't know what else you would think we were talking about, but that's what we're going to be looking at. The Alternative hypothesis, that's our other one. So what is that and how are we going to use it? So our ha contains the value of the perimeter that we consider plausible if we reject the null. So in our case, we are looking at 20%. That was our null hypothesis. So our alternative would be the new method. So in this case, our alternative hypothesis is going to be the 17% that they got by using the new method. So the original one, your null, is the 20%, and our alternative is what we believe to be the better true method afterwards, which is the 17%. So our question of inquiry kind of determines our HA. Sometimes we look at it as, what's our probability of success? Sometimes we're looking at it as like, hey, we want to know 
if the mean is actually higher than what they said or the standard deviation is actually less than what we originally thought. Whatever it is we're questioning is what determines our HA. In this case, we're determining if our new method take, has less cracks than our old one. So a lot of the time, this is not going to be an equal. So like for HO, for your HO, you're always using the perimeter of interest equals your number. For your HA, your alternative, it will change, all right? Your three major ones that we're gonna see here, in this case, again, you still start with your perimeter of interest on the left, but instead of having an equal sign, you will have one of three things. You will either claim, I just wanna show that the original statement is incorrect, so you have a not equal to sign. So we would say that it's not equal to the 20% that we originally thought. Now, the other alternative would be, like in our case, we believe that it's 17% from this new process, not the 20. So we believe that it is actually now less than the 20% that we had originally. Now, if we were looking at some other situation where we thought that this process possibly created more cracks than the original process did, then our alternative hypothesis would be that we believe the new P is greater than that 20%. So we still use the same number on the right-hand side that we used in the null. So a lot of times your HO and HA, your hose and haws look exactly the same because you have the same letter on the left and the same number on the right. The only thing that changes is the symbol in between them. For your HO, it's the original sign because we assume that that is true. But for your HA, it's whatever it is you're actually looking into. In this case, we think that our new cooling method created something that will produce less cracks than the original. So we want to run a test to prove that it is indeed less than the original. So we use this guy right here of the p-value being less than the 20%. All right. So that kind of says that again down here. It says, for example, if we hope to find evidence that new medication decreases the percent of infection, our HA will be that P is less than the current percent that they have. Cool. So let's go ahead and do an example. Looking at this, it says a large city's Department of Motor Vehicles claimed that 80% of candidates passed the driving test, but a newspaper reporter survey of 90 randomly selected local teens who had taken the test found that only 68 passed, all right? So if you're looking at this and we say, okay, wait a second, they said 80% of all candidates are, are passing this test. So they go out and they look, and it turns out only 68 out of the 90 passed which is only 75.5 repeated percent. So 75 versus 80, this seems to be low. So the question is, is this low enough that it was just an unlucky sample, or is it so low that we're gonna claim that original 80% is a lie, and indeed it's actually lower than that 80%. So it says here for the question, does, finding, does this finding suggest the passing rate for teenagers is lower than the DMV reported? Write your appropriate hypotheses. We are not doing the full hypothesis test at this point. All we are doing right now is practice on writing our HO and our HA. So remember, when we are writing our HO and our HA, we always have two things. On the left-hand side, we have our perimeter of interest. And on the right-hand side, we have the assumed value to be true. So what are we looking at here? They're claiming that 80% of their candidates passed the driving test. That 80% is a proportion of the population that they say succeeds. So that means the parameter we're looking at is P. Now, when we are looking at different tests later on in the future chapters, that's when this letter is gonna change. But for this chapter, it's gonna be P every time because this whole chapter is on one proportion Z tests. So we're always gonna be using P on the left-hand side for this. It's not gonna be until later when we start looking at mean standard deviations, chi-squared tests, things like that, that we're gonna be changing that left-hand side of our null and alternative. Now, we said that the null hypo hypothesis is always equal to. Now, what value is the proportion assumed to be equal to? That 0.80, all right? So we write that, there is our ho, that's our null hypothesis, it's done, it's ready to go. Now, how about our ha? ha. That's the alternative and what we're trying to prove is actually correct if the null turns out being incorrect. So in this case, here's how we're gonna write it. 
we're going to say we want to know if this proportion is actually less than the 80% that they claim. And we choose less than because it specifically says that we want to know if the teenagers is lower than what the DMV reported. Now, what words would change this symbol right here? Well, if we said we want to know if the passing rate for teenagers is higher, we would use greater than. Or if they simply say something like it is not 80%, they don't care if it's higher or lower. We just want to prove that they're wrong. And we just want to know that it is not that uh, original reported value. That's when we use something like the not equal to symbol. Okay. So there are three options that we can use for this HA. We can either use the less than, the less than, the greater than, or the not equal to. It just depends on what we're trying to find. In this case, we want to prove that it is actually lower than the 80% that they provided. So I feel like this is going to be enough for you guys to chew on for right now. So we're going to call it a wrap for the day. Um, but remember, these videos will be continuing to air on TV. You can check them out on my YouTube channel. You can see them on your Schoology website that goes along with the class. So keep checking in. Keep watching them. Remember, what did we cover today? We talked about what a hypothesis test is. We talked about the seven steps that we're going to be using to do one. And specifically, we covered what a null and alternative hypothesis was. Now, we know how to write them. We've mastered that skill. I'm sure you guys are all pros at it by this point. But we still have quite a bit more of this process to do. So in the next few videos, we're going to finish up going through that entire process so that when you guys are given a question like this, you're able to run a full hypothesis test all the way through. And we're going to end up using this concept of testing for the rest of the year. So this is going to be a major, major topic. All right. So again, thank you guys for joining me. Uh, if you are getting lost or confused or you want to re-see this video to try to see something that we did, remember you can always find my videos on YouTube at Mr. Caproni. No space, no period. With that said, hope you guys learned something new. And as always, stay fit, stay healthy, and have a wonderful day.